Welcome to Thursday Night Knives. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, Bob Terzuola makes tactical tweezers for Civivi. Interesting story. Uh, we take a look at an oldie but a goodie. And then we have Doug Ritter with us here tonight of Knife Rights to discuss uh, Knife Rights' 15th birthday and other good things uh, in the offing, including uh, the ultimate steel. Hey, Ben, great to have you here, sir. Always a pleasure. Shane Gables, how you doing, sir? Hope you're doing well. We have Chris Bladeoger, the Bowie junkie. I know, he's like, don't pigeonhole me. Hey, Michael, great to have you here. Michael Morgan says hello to Bob and Jim. We have Caleb Townsend. Caleb, always a pleasure to have you here, sir. And uh, so this evening, I, I am going to be talking a little bit more about the birthday bash. Hey, Dave, how's it coming? Good to have you here, sir. Uh, so we have a birthday bash coming up Saturday afternoon. Time to still be determined. Uh, I, I've i started at noon in the past, but I think for our, our good friends on the West Coast, we'll start maybe a little bit later. But uh, we're going to have a, a birthday bash. Uh, Jim's birthday is this month. My birthday is this month. And then as it turns out, a lot of other friends of the show have birthdays in this month. So we're going to have a birthday bash uh, replete with guests. We have three already booked and then several others who really want to come but are checking their calendars. Um, and these are people that you're familiar with, people that I've interviewed, and people that are going to be coming with swag. So we're going to have a lot of giveaway stuff. Uh, and, you know, what what uh, what's a birthday party without without party favors? So we're going to be doing – we're going to be using uh, this this whole platform that we use here – has built into it a random giveaway um, feature. And it's not as cool or dramatic as the spinning wheel of destiny, which we use for the gentleman junkie giveaways, but it, it uh, randomly selects from comments. And uh, so we're going to be giving away some good stuff. We have a couple of knives, uh, two of which uh, were donated by Dave, this old sword blade reviews who's on right now. One of which was donated by Shane Gables. We have one coming from the Finch Knife Company. And, uh, you know, I know we're going to have some TRM scales and some other cool stuff. So we're going to have a lot of good stuff to give away. Uh, there's more to come. Hey, Incognito, always a pleasure. My day's been going pretty well. Much better now. We have G-Man. How's it going, sir? It's going well here with us. Ash, pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Talking about the birthday bash. Saturday, August 21st time. TBD. That means to be determined. Uh, there's a little bit of mansplaining on my part. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, Jared, Mr. Strasbaugh. Great to have you here. And uh, he says hello to me and all fellow knife junkies. Uh, really, come join us. Not only participate in the comments, but hey, Scott, pleasure to have you here, sir. And North Code, Ryan, we have you here, perhaps with your son. Uh, actually, you're, uh, in any case, join us via comments or just go to the knifejunkie.com slash join that also uh stands for tonight as well and come on to the birthday bash and say hi to people ask these uh ask our guests questions in virtual person and um uh, a fun time will be had by all i'm really looking forward to it it will be one week after my real birthday bash uh and uh, jim will be in attendance hopefully um and a uh, bunch of friends from work and a bunch of family and a bunch of friends from uh, just friends. We're going to do a pig roast. I'm very much looking forward to it. And uh, my folks have very generously uh, commissioned a work of cutting art from, uh, from Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives. He's been on the show. Great guy, a former Marine scout sniper who has been forging knives for 20 some odd years and um, well, I commissioned a loveless sub-hilt fighter from him uh, and, and with all sorts of special goodies, including Stag and uh, his own pattern Damascus. And oh my God, he sent me pictures of it. He just finished it. He's working on the sheath now. It is out of this world gorgeous. I will be getting that a week before our birthday bash here, and I'll be showing it off there for sure. Talking a lot about it too, no doubt. If you like Jim running the switcher, leave a like. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ryan. That's right. Comment, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, check in with us when we're not live also because uh, I've been posting a lot of close-up videos of knives. That's what I call them. I don't really call them reviews because uh, I'm not reviewing things that I don't like. So it's it's a little bit, uh, you know, I just, I just put the... Uh, 
put the knife close up to the camera and talk about what I like about about knives and tomahawks and such. Uh, so check out those. And of course, uh, the Sunday interview show and then the midweek supplemental, um, which is uh, which is a really fun show to do. Got even more fun recently because we had Doug Ritter on this last show uh, that went up yesterday. Yes, uh, Sunday we have Josiah DeMille of Millet Knives. And man, so that's uh, number 238. You can go to thenifejunkie.com slash 238 or check it out on YouTube whatever uh, you prefer. But talking to Josiah was awesome. He was a really interesting dude, man. And and just, it was such a great um, eye-opening um, conversation, just learning about how uh, Millet Knife Company, uh, you know, they're an OEM out in uh, Idaho, just how they kind of got there, how, how they came to be. And uh, very, very cool story. Really cool guy. And uh, he works with his dad. His dad started the company and they both worked at Chris Reeve Knives uh, back in the day and decided to start their own operation. And uh, I've had one of the knives that they've produced on the show here, the Newfoundland uh, Ranger, Newfoundland Knives Ranger. It's over there in my knife cabinet. I don't have it here uh, in, the, in the clutter on my desk. Um, but just top flight OEM production knives and, and some under their own label. And they're going to be pushing further and further into making their own uh, label knives. Excuse me, mania. Good to have you, Bob. You got to stop this former Marine talk. <laughs> what do you mean? He's a former, right? You, you don't say, you don't say X, right? Because once a Marine, all always a Marine, right? So it's former. Isn't that what you say? Um, Shane says, uh, I've got some health setbacks and haven't mailed the giveaway knife, uh, but should be able to, to tomorrow. Well, thank you, Shane. I really appreciate that. Don't, you know, take your time. You, ha you have basically till the 21st to get it here. Um, and then, and then even not, even in absentia, you know, just watch out for your health. That's the most important thing. But thank you again for donating that off grid sea dog. Hag 90 says, hi, Bob. Great to have you, Hag, as always. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Indeed, you know, I have, uh, we have some very close friends who are Marines and my brother-in-law, and um, there is just a quality, uh, an excellent, excellent quality um, that they've all retained um, from that. A uh, good friend of ours, he's one of the first guests on the show uh, named uh, Drew Swift, good friend of ours, uh, my one of my wife's oldest, dearest friends, um, is now teaching uh, people how to shoot here in the area we live in and has a really cool service. So he's, he's taken that uh, skill that he learned so many years ago and passing it along to people. And uh, actually, incidentally, a lot of people who aren't into guns, who are first time gun owners, and he's, he's finding those people, great clientele, especially around, around in this area. Anyway. Uh, so let's talk, uh, Pocket check. Sorry. Had a little senior moment there. Let's talk pocket check because uh, I've been thinking about these two knives all day and how cool they are. And I broke a, I broke a minor rule today in that I had two flippers on me. And, uh, you know, ordinarily I prefer not to have two of the same lock, two of the same, act, uh, you know, actuation type. That's not the right word. Uh, deployment type or two of the same brand, or two of the same lock type, or two of the, two of the same blade type. Today, I had two drop points, and they're both flippers. Um, but I just, uh, I don't know. I, I didn't know which one to choose, so I, I had them both. And then, of course, uh, I'll, I'll show my true EDC, the one that I really actually do carry every single day. Well, at least five days a week. Uh, so first off, uh, I'll put this under the knife cam. We have the Crystal Knives Aurora from Russia designed by Ivan Braganets and uh, just such a beautiful knife. I know a lot of people have, have gotten these recently um, and I'm pretty sure we've all gotten them through Levon of the Knife Nuts podcast. He has a new uh, import company where he is importing really cool Russian knives from companies like Kristal and, uh, and uh, designers like Braganets. Mm, excuse me. And this one, I think, is the coolest one going. And it is because of that giant fuller in the blade. And uh, 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 someone just recently told me what Russian knife this is a tip of the hat to. And now I'm forgetting. So if you're out there, please let me know. I cannot remember 
at this point, but uh, it's a knife type I've heard of. I just can't remember which one. This thing is so cool. The action on this is amazing because it's a flipper or you can use the uh, the blade uh, blade stops as thumb studs and it rockets out, right, on bearings. Just rockets out beautifully. But the, the way it closes is so nice and quote unquote hydraulic. You know, that's that that term for giving solid, even resistance on the close. It is not false shutty unless you shake it in. It's shake shutty. And that's one of the qualities of this knife I really love is that it, it's so pleasing to close it. Ah, and then it's got a nice, uh, nice detent, uh, very nice milling and sort of uh, which acts as jimping on the, on the sculpted pocket clip. So when you're pulling it from your pocket, you have this strip of milling, which acts like jimping, and this strip of milling, which acts like jimping. Boom, pops right out, deploys, cut your apple. Uh, very thin, very slicey. I feel like the spine is quite thick, and then they lose a lot of material here in the uh, fuller, and then I, I feel like it picks up much thinner here, uh, as if if you didn't have this fuller and you just went straight from here to here, it wouldn't be as thin behind the edge. I think they do something here, but I, I haven't really actually uh, measured it. So who knows? Someone, just not me. All right. Uh, or not I, I guess. Uh, so there's that. And then here's one of my most fall shuddy. What sword is on your left beside the dagger? This one right here. This is a, um, a Chris, a straight bladed Chris that my brother got me. Well, he didn't get it for me. He gave it to me. He already had it. It's not that straight. It's pretty wavy, actually. Uh, beautiful, beautiful Chris from the Philippines. You got your, this one has the full sort of elephant thing. Uh, on my other one, that had fallen off and a really nice hilt with the, uh, with the jute wrapping. Is that jute? I don't know, some sort of natural fiber wrap there. Yep, there you go. I'm late to this party. Knives Collector 41. Great to have you here, Brent. As always, I'm going to try and hang that up. Oh, man. Hopefully that doesn't fall. You know what I've wondered is like all of these things, except for the tomahawk, which is actually off the wall because I, I wanted it close at hand, are old and have been used somewhere. And uh, except for the actually the Bowie over my right shoulder also has not been. But I always wondered what they've what they've done, where they've been, and if they've retained any of that, uh, any of that energy. All right. Uh, next is the Vero Engineering Synapse. What an amazing knife this is. God, I love this knife. And uh, it is so fall shuddy. It's like, uh, you know, I was commenting on how I like the fact that you have to sort of, uh, whoops, that's wrong, manually close this one. This one, you don't. Let me just you just have to get your thumb out of the way. Beautiful design. I really, really glad I got this. Um, I love the Vero engineering on the back. Everything about this knife is pleasing. This natural canvas micarta has has yet to fully, you know, I've rubbed some mineral oil in there and uh, it, it always rubs out. So uh, I'm going to have to do it the natural way and just paw the thing and let it take on my personal filth signature. Love this knife. Uh, I would really, really like the large version. I'm not sure what it's called, but yeah, uh, I think it's uh, it's a moral imperative at some point that I get an, a large Vero. And um, when I was at Blade Show 2021 at the Vero desk or, or booth, I should say, I got to check out their um, integral and oh my gosh, that's the one I want. That is the one I want. Okay, so the third knife I had on me today um, I carry it like this around my neck and then this is under my shirt. Uh, but this is my work ID. And then behind it, I have this work ID, Bastinelli Diagnostic. So just a great little two finger karambit style knife, hawkbill style knife. And, um, not, it looks, it's less delicate than it looks because it's chisel ground. So you have a, a good amount of uh, a good amount of steel there, comes down to a, a uh, kind of a sharp slope, sharp angle there. And then man, nasty tip there. 
And uh, yeah, you could definitely use this for self defense get off me kind of situations. But really, it, it's a great utility knife. And, uh, you know, you, okay. Great utility knife, maybe maybe not exactly, but for little things like opening envelopes or, or opening boxes, being a little bit dramatic doing it, this is a great, a great, uh, great option. So there you go. That's what I had on me today. What were you carrying? I am curious. Uh, let me know. Uh, I'd, I'd love to find out. Uh, this helps me. This also gives me ideas on some of the things that I've forgotten about that I need to get at some point. Um, man, I've uh, I've had a couple of weeks just kind of taking it easy and not not getting anything. And then uh, this one JB knife popped up called a uh, called the Ditch Pick. <laughs> uh, great great night a knife evocative of a nasty uh, encounter. But really, what it is is a Pical style blade with the tip down edge in curvy blade and uh, sharp on both sides. Waiting for that one to come in, and then. Um, and then I got something else uh, that is going to be something else, but I'll show it. I'll show it to you when it get when it gets here. I'm very excited about that, Mr. Doug Ritter. How's it going, sir? It's going great. Oh, Always it's, a pleasure. Oh, it's great to have you. I was just uh, telling everybody while well, we were doing a pocket check, and actually, before we get into it, what are you carrying today? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to guess an RSK one. There you go. Mm, the mini in orange. The mini in orange. So I've been, I was using this, the the uh, purple Timascus mini all weekend. This was, uh, I, I put two screen doors up this past weekend. Um, and uh, by the end of the weekend, I was an expert at the, at the, uh, at the activity, at the task, I should say. And this was the one that, that popped open all the clamshell boxes and everything. We had Michael Morgan saying, good evening to you, sir. So, good uh, evening. Uh, uh, good evening. It's cool to be here. Well, it's great to have you. Uh, let me let me let me just uh, regale you with a with a with a quick tale of this. I had to come up with a shim uh, for to to make sure that the first door I did was straight. You know, our house is from the fifties, so it's, our porch is a little. You know, not everything is exactly square. So I had to get it perfectly perfectly shimmed in there. And I, all I had was a big kind of door wedge thing. So this was the knife I used to take that door wedge and, and make it a really thin shim. And it, it was a, it was a pleasure to use, you know, I, it's I really, always great to hear that somebody's actually using these knives. Um, <laughs> that's why that that's what we created them for is to be used. Um, not to be stuck away. They're working <laughs> yeah. Oh, agreed. We have uh, Incognito saying uh, he's the president of all knife wielders. I, I like that. <laughs> well, we try. <laughs> the guys over at Shredder, uh, that, that's a, uh, uh, a young man. I think he's about 10 or 11 at this point. And his father have a great knife, uh, knife channel called Shredder Knife Reviews. And I know, that, I know they have commented on your knives very, uh, very positively. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a great user knife as well as just a pleasing in every way. Love this thing. I love hearing that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, tell me, Doug, we, we, we just talked about this on the Wednesday supplemental, but for those who missed that, what right now are you, uh, are you celebrating over at Knife Rights? Well, this is really our 15th anniversary of the terrible Wall Street Journal article that, you know, incensed me, got me pissed off, and uh, was what drove me to found knife rights. Um, wouldn't have happened other than the World, Wall Street Journal trying to take down tactical knives. Um, and and that's, that's what we're celebrating. We just launched the tail end bonus and our ultimate steel fundraiser, some really great prizes. Um, uh, right now, our top prize is uh, a wonderful pair of Bren, uh, Walter Bren and Kay Bren Ives, a uh, his and her set that mm. they're working on with Damascus and Mammoth. Uh, that's going to be really cool. Um, but it all started with that article. And uh, so that's what we're celebrating. 15 years of getting pissed off and counting <laughs> knife rights. Well, you know, that's funny. Uh, hey, Jim, can you put the uh, that article back up? 
when you have a second, uh, that, that article is, uh, I, I find it hilarious. I mean, that, that they would, well, first of all, the, the headline, how new deadly pocket knives became a one billion dollar business, and then they show this little tiny carabiner knife. It's it's kind of hilarious. But as you mentioned, ironic. Uh, I mean, I, it was perfect. It was you know, an inch and an eighth inch blade, and and one hand opening, and uh, a locking blade, and now it's a evil, deadly tactical knife. I mean, it was, just, it was, couldn't have asked for the editor to do us a better favor yeah. beyond just pissing me off and getting me to found knife rights. <laughs> it's so funny because, uh, uh, well, uh, Joe said, everyone raise a blade to, to Mr. Ritter. So there we go. Thank raise, you. Raising my RSK one. Um, yeah, exactly. Hag deadly. It's, it is funny, man. They really did do you a favor by putting that up there. If, 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 I mean, this editor, if he if he had a, a brain, uh, half a half a half a neuron or whatever, he, there are plenty of scary looking knives. You know, scary looking knives in quotes you so, could throw you up have, there. You have to ask yourself: Did he do this because he's ignorant, or did he do this on purpose? And we'll never know. But uh, it's certainly been fun to uh, point out the irony of this this absolutely malevolent article against. <laughs> tactical knives and that little buck metro yeah. yeah maybe maybe the little buck metro maybe you could maybe he's actually a closet knife guy and he got orders from above and he's like okay i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna start something here well we'll never know but um <laughs> yeah it look the end result was we founded knife rights um 15 years later 34 bills passed in 23 states and over 150 cities released from really terrible knife bans that had no rational basis to begin with. And turning back 150 years of bad knife laws, um, it's been a great run. And, you know, we're planning to continue it with everyone's support. Oh, yeah, because there's there's still more to be done for sure. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to run out of work anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just keep keep. Man, keep at it. I know that there's weird stuff happening in Texas, of all places. Uh, Texas was very peculiar this year. Of course, everywhere was a little peculiar this year. Yeah, um, yeah they, they wanted to pass a law that would have required any retail establishment, and that would have, by their definition, included every knife show. Uh, any knife on display would have had to been locked up. So, I mean, can you imagine a knife show with a couple hundred knife boxes <laughs> locked up and oh you want to see this one i have to unlock it nope yeah oh my it, God. It, it, was, it was crazy but you know if you don't show up stupid things like that get passed yeah and that's been our secret i mean we show up every year i mean new york nine and a half years of fighting that battle um that's the secret but it you know costs money to do that uh, yeah yeah, that's it. That is the that is the the through line there. Just show up. Uh, I think it was Woody Allen who, of all people, said ninety percent of life is showing up. Uh, and in this case, it, it is true. Deadly Doug, I like that. <clears throat> yeah, little did you know, Doug, Deadly Doug would be a good fifteen years. Congratulations, Doug. So, um, you know, I'm always talking about the RSK one because that's the folder and that's the one that I carry the most. Um, Wait, what's this say? I let my mini RSK <laughs> stay up late. <laughs> That's great. Um, but you also just had released the Mark III, this this gorgeous, uh, uh, I'm a Texas man, I carry anything. <laughs> That's brand you new. Know, yeah, he sure does. You do? But the reason you can carry it legally is because of knife rights and... Um, you know, every year since 2013, being there to continue to roll back. I mean, Texas, Texas wasn't really what everyone thinks Texas is. And, you know, it still isn't in some respects. And Texas had terrible knife laws. So, I mean, you couldn't carry a Bowie knife in Texas until we fixed that in 2017. I mean, legally, you couldn't carry a Bowie knife. Home of the Alamo, you couldn't carry a Bowie knife. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we've, we've had to go back every year. I mean, we still got a little work to do. Um, but again, you know, sometimes you get it all done in one fell swoop. 
but that doesn't happen very often. You know, a lot of states, we just keep going back and back and back, rolling things back slowly but surely to get to nothing, which right. is what we aim for. No illegal knives. So uh, the guys at Shredder Knives say thank you uh, to the Knife Junkie and Doug. After the last interview with Doug, we have started supporting knife rights. Thank you for all you Great. guys do. Thank and you. Keep knife, knife rights as free as possible. So, Appreciate it. Appreciate so, it very much. I was about to talk about talk about this Mark III, which uh, has gotten a lot of really good reviews recently. Uh, one of them uh, was mine. I absolutely love this knife, but I know um, Metal Complex loved it. Uh, Slicey Dicey loves it. A lot, lots of folks uh, really love this this knife, and even some and I guys. Love that. What's Just that? Saying, I love hearing that. <laughs> And and also this is coming from from some guys who are just folder folder folks you know they just are really their passion is folders, of course um, uh, my passions uh, range a wide you know I love all sorts of knives and um, this one is awesome I love it and we talked about it a little bit on the on the uh, podcast this week but I also wanted to show off the Mark V ah. this thing is so cool so uh, I have yet to. Uh, I have yet to fill it in. So if uh, if you haven't seen this knife yet, this is the this is a the size of a sucrets tin if you're old and you remember sucrets or oh, an or oh, an oh, altoids oh. tin, yeah. And uh, it's the same size, so and we've all heard of the altoids survival kit, you know, you can fit everything you need in here. Well, Doug a, a while ago uh, designed this knife to fit such a uh, such a survival kit, and uh, it was previously produced by CRKT. And tell us tell us about how this came to market this last time. Well, first, give some credit where credits due. Uh, knife maker David White and a friend of his had gotten together and and decided that they wanted to design a knife that would fit in an Altoids tin. And uh, David and his friend showed it to me, and I said, you know, that's not bad. I think we can make it better and let's see if we can get someone to produce it. And so we ended up, uh, CRKT produced it and, and made thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And they were very popular. And eventually, uh, like a lot of things, it, it, they stopped producing it. Um, and Blue Ridge Knives uh, had such a good run with it that they wanted to reproduce it again. And they went back to the same factory that CRKT used. Um, it's it's the same knife. It's, you know, it was designed specifically to fit in a little survival kit, something that would fit in your pocket. But it turns out to be just a great little neck knife or yeah. pocket knife. If it'll fit in a, you know, watch pocket. Um, it's, uh, it's proving very popular. Uh, we have the stone wash version, we have a black version, uh, black coated version. Um, and it's proving as popular the second time around. Um, and one of the great things is Blue Ridge Knives, it's like under 15 bucks, um, almost half the cost that when CRKT produced it. So <laughs> you don't often see that sort of thing happen. Um, same quality, same factory, uh, same adequate steel. I mean, it, there's nothing fancy about it, but it gets the job done. And you know, under 15 bucks at your favorite knife shop. I mean, this, this could be a great neck knife. Uh, I love neck knives, carry them all the time. Mm -hmm. And this would fit behind my work ID. It's so small. And that's, that's where my neck knives ride primarily. Um, but and also the is designed for that specifically. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. But also this has really great geometry. I mean, this blade, if you look at this blade, the blade, uh, the stock is nice and thin. And then it's a pretty broad blade for the size and it's got that nice uh um it's got that nice flat grind and it's really thin behind the edge i mean this is a great little knife not just for the size and and the application but just at all it's just a great I'm, little I'm knife. A big believer that knives are designed to slice so most of all my knives are slicing knives because that's what you end up using them for for most things um, so they're designed to be used the cool thing, another cool thing about this is the packaging. Of course, it comes in this uh, Doug Ritter uh, Altoids sized tin. And inside, here, I'm going to close this so it doesn't flare. Inside, you have this great um, pamphlet 
talking about uh, what to uh, what to put in there. Fire starter, tinder, signal mirror, you know, whistle, compass, duct tape, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I just think that's really cool. So uh, some people might not know that you have a company that you founded a company called Equip to Design. I mean, equipped equipped to, survive. To, to survive, not to design. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about that and uh, and then how you came up with this list. So I started Equipped to Survive, I guess, going on close to 30 years ago. I mean, the Internet was really young when we started it or when I started it. And it, it's it, when I started it, the idea was to be something like Consumer Reports for Survival Gear. So uh, reviews of products, which is how I met a lot of people in the knife industry, um, going to shows and reviewing their products. And um, that eventually led to where we're at now. Um, not doing a lot with it. And knife rights is taking up a tremendous amount of my time. But, um, you know, the resources that are on Equipped to Survive at Equip.org, uh, a lot of that is evergreen. A lot of that is is what to, I, I tried when we wrote articles that were a review to explain why things were good or bad. So even if it's something that isn't produced anymore, if you read that, you're going to have a good idea of how to judge whether something is good or bad. Um, and that really, it's, an educational site as well as a review site. Um, and, and we still get a tremendous amount of, of traffic on it. Uh, it just surprises me. It's an old site. It could probably be redone and fit on a phone better. But right, I just, right. uh, there's only so many hours in the day and, and knife rights is, uh, is taking up those hours. Well, we all appreciate that for sure. Someone was just mentioning how this would make a great gift. And I'll I'll take it one step further and say stocking stuffer. I mean, yep. we're coming up on Christmas, people. Just kidding. We're not. But <laughs> we're coming up. Uh, Christmas you know. in July. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll be here soon enough. And uh, I mean, you're right. This would make a great gift because it's not going to break the bank. But it's the sort of thing that someone can build on. You know, I was looking at the list inside with the items that should you know, you should consider putting in the survival kit. And, uh, you know, for me and my purposes, I think eh, maybe I wouldn't put fish hooks. Maybe I'd put, you know, uh, uh, Advil, you know, because depending on your, on your lifestyle, you know, I have a very urban slash suburban lifestyle here and, uh, Chances, well, if, if you're going to survive in the city, it's different tools than yeah, uh, right. gear than if you're going to survive in the wilderness. Exactly. Uh, that list is designed for someone who's going off camping, hiking, backpacking, um, and needs to carry the basics in their pocket. But but what I'm getting at is like this this translates and is scalable across all mm -hmm. sorts of lifestyles. You know. Oh yeah. Uh, you know. Um, my my survival kit used to when I lived in New York City used to have you know an extra subway card in it. Used to have like all sorts of stuff that. It, that came in handy there, you know, that has been since abandoned. Uh, but you know, just depending on where you are. Oh, by the way, the, the guys at the uh, shredder knife review said that they just bought like uh, bought a bottom Mark three, right. As we were talking and they can't wait to beat the snot out of it. They say <laughs> their tools, please use them like they're meant to be used. So kept Mook Nesshart, good name here, uh, would love to see a preemption law in Iowa. So would we, you know, we, we passed the nation's first preemption law in Arizona in 2010. Uh, we're up to 12 states now, so almost a quarter of the country. Um, it's a process. Uh, we have two bills running currently, two preemption bills currently in Michigan and uh, Ohio. Um, we've got another one coming along that if things go well, will be filed before the end of the summer. Um, it's a process. Um, some of these states preemption went easy. Some of the states it's taken a while. Uh, you know, if 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 you want us to work in your state, one of the things we need is uh, legislators to work with. So sometimes we get those legislators because people in a state 
uh, talk to their their own legislator, their own member of the House or Assembly, their own member of their Senate, and discuss this with them and make an introduction because they're interested. Um, we we can take the ball and run with it if you find us a legislator who's interested in pursuing this. Uh, don't be afraid to talk to your legislators. You should be talking to them anyway. There are a lot of issues besides your snives that people need to get involved in. And yeah. it's not just voting. It's talking to them, letting them know how you feel. Most of these legislators have meetings. Go to the meeting, introduce yourself, tell them what's important to you. Yeah. This is this is how you get things done. You you yeah, you can sit at the computer and you can certainly express your opinions on social media. But if you really want to get things done, go introduce yourself to your representative. Go introduce yourself to your assemblyman, to your senator, and give them a piece of your mind. Politely helps, but yeah, yeah. You know, let them know what's important to you. He wants your vote. Uh, these these um, most of these public meetings, by the way, Blade Freak says, help us in Minnie, uh, Minnesota. Uh, most of these, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, local uh, political meetings are public, like all of them are pretty much. And, and uh, you know, on some sort of, usually it's a quarterly basis, they have open comment. So you get three to five minutes to stand up there and, uh, and give them a piece of your mind or, or you know, tell them what you think uh, needs to be worked on. I've witnessed and it many, many times. And one, one of the things that's really important to understand, because we get a, a lot of folks who are listening, who have representatives that don't necessarily vote the way they would like. Mm -hmm. um, but almost all our bills pass with bipartisan support. Um, it's criminal justice reform. It's their constituents that are being arrested for having the wrong kind of pocket knife in their pocket. Um, we get a lot of support from both sides of the aisle. So don't be put off, don't be put off talking to your representative or your assemblyman or your senator just because they don't vote the way you would like most of the time. Uh, this is an important issue for both sides of the aisle. And they don't want their people arrested for carrying a pocket knife any more than the other folks do. Right. So just because you may not have voted for them. Doesn't mean you can can't go talk to them about something that's important to you, and that once they're educated about, will be important to them. Yeah, uh, our good friends uh, Alex and Ryan both uh, say, say hello and send their uh, their thanks to you. And here we have Patina Turner saying, "Can you clarify basic knife laws in California, Mr. Ritter? I think most people have the wrong idea of what they really are." So this is a perfect opportunity for me to pitch the Legal Blade app. Um, the Legal Blade app has the knife laws for all 50 states and DC uh, for many of the larger cities. It includes links so you can find uh, your town or city if it's not listed. California doesn't have the worst knife laws by far in the country. That, that would be New Jersey. Um, and, you know, they don't have preemption, so even though their state laws aren't all that bad, I mean, you can pretty much carry what you want as long as it's not concealed. Um, legal, there you go, legal blade. Um, the uh, the switchblade law is uh, restricting you to under two inches. Um, that's annoying. Um, there's actually no law in California that says you can't own a switchblade. Uh, you simply can't carry it, buy it, or sell it in the store. <laughs> uh, so, and, and a knife with a blade under two inches is not a switchblade, according to uh, California law, even if it opens with the press of a button. Um, now, there are, there are much worse states than, than California. Uh, as I say, New Jersey is probably the worst in the country, uh, besides all their restrictions. Uh, breaking any knife law in New Jersey is a felony. It's the only state where every knife law uh, is a felony. It's just ridiculous. Whew. My brother used to live in Hoboken uh, and I visited him. He was there for a couple of years uh, after 9-11 and I would go visit him and I didn't pay any attention to knife laws in those days. <laughs> I'm glad I never got in trouble well, over and, there. Man. And, and that's the thing. It's only a problem when you have a problem. Yeah. 
Um, and and we, we have lots of people who come to us up at a show and say, I don't care what the law is. I'm going to carry what I want. And that's fine until I get the phone call from them. Hey, I just got arrested at a traffic stop or um, that's the problem. That's what we work to prevent. If we can get rid of the knife law, then that's the way it goes. Yeah. Nothing happens. That's what we want. Tri-State EDC was just saying, like, I should not be pulled over and accosted for carrying a necessary tool, you know. No, you shouldn't. But that, we, we're, we're not living in rebel without a cause here, right? <laughs> um, you know, the problem is that it's always the exceptions. And I hate getting these phone calls and emails uh, from people who have been arrested simply for carrying a tool. Hmm. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's not much we can do. Uh, we can recommend sometimes a really good attorney, but oftentimes being a misdemeanor, you know, you lose your knife, you pay a small fine, you go off, but that's not always the case. Yeah. Um, we've had people who've ended up in court and felonies and all kinds of problems um, that result from a knife. Uh, we won a case with, uh, we, we were uh, Michi in a case in California where basically uh, our current vice president as attorney general was prosecuting a young man for carrying a Swiss army knife and trying to say it was an illegal dagger and had a locking blade. And that mm. case went to the California Supreme Court. Uh, we won the case unanimously, um, somewhat surprisingly, I guess. Uh, but the fact is, you know, you get some of these prosecutors will prosecute you just because they can. Um, yeah, they, so, they need uh, they need some cheap labor to fight the fires out there. Yeah, I, I you know, I caution people to be careful about breaking the laws in their states or their cities and, and, and towns um, because it's not a problem till it's a problem. And then it can be a really big problem and help us get rid of those laws. And then you won't have to worry about it. Uh, Incognito Griffin is uh, asking about Florida, but before we get to that, just clarify what a preemption is because a uh, preemption bill, because to me, that seems like a pretty important thing. And uh, so, you just clarified that for me on Wednesday. So, so, so preemption is when state law prevents any local laws from being more restrictive than what the state law is. So you don't get a patchwork of laws that are more restrictive than state law. So if there's no illegal knives in the state and we pass knife law preemption, then all the local laws are voided and they can't pass any more laws. Um, so it's, it's really important. You know, we're not big enough and almost nobody's big enough to go to, from city to city and town to town and convince them to roll back their knife restrictions, of which there are often many, even in what you would call good states. Uh, but if we pass knife law preemption, then that takes care of the whole state. So the, the basic philosophy is get rid of the bad laws at the state level, repeal those laws, then pass knife law preemption and repeal all the local restrictions. Does that make so, sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, uh, um, I don't remember if Virginia has one, but I, I really hope it does. <laughs> uh, uh, Virginia doesn't. Uh, Virginia uh, has some, some pretty bad yeah. knife laws in terms of restrictions. Um, we, uh, we, 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 twice passed bills in Virginia, uh, both times that were vetoed by the governor. Um, so we, yeah, we cause he was, he, <laughs> he was just busted wearing blackface when that happened. So he didn't want anything that might have been, uh, perceived as controversial. Uh, well, you know, we have had bills vetoed before. I don't think we've ever quite had a bill vetoed with the moral outrage uh, that he presented, that, you know, the, the state has decided that, that automatic knives are bad for our people. So we don't want our businesses to even sell or trade in these knives in other states where they're completely legal, like mm -hmm. uh, 44 other states where switchblades are legal to one degree or another. Um, it was pretty outrageous, but yeah. we'll be back. I mean, we don't, we don't give up. Yeah, you know? and he he won't be our governor forever. This guy's a joker. He uh, he won't be your governor after twenty two. Yeah, 
I, I've seen him in one uh, in one event I was covering go from I'm just a simple country doctor to like speaking like he just washed out of Harvard. It was the funniest thing. I was like, depending on who he was talking to, he affected a different accent. But anyway, enough about that guy. Um, what what about Florida? Uh, what about Florida? So oh, Incognito Griffin what... here, it, it, yeah, wants to know he's going to be going down there. And uh, I, I think we all know Florida uh, as one of the craziest states in a, in, a, in a good way and sometimes entertaining way, but also uh, a, a pretty liberty-minded state, uh, at least these days. Florida oh. life laws are, are pretty good. I mean, pretty much anything goes in Florida. Um, they don't have knife law preemption, so there are some cities and towns that have more restrictive laws. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of the states, Florida is certainly well into the upper quarter, I would say, um, or half for sure. Um, there are no per se illegal knives in Florida. You know, that's always a good place to start with. We do need to do preemption. Uh, we've had a couple efforts at that that haven't gotten too far, but We'll be back. We'll always be back. <laughs> I, I have a question for you. What um, do you, in in your, uh, you personally, Doug Ritter, are there any knives that you think should be, should not be permitted? No. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> Good answer. These, it, it is our philosophy that unless the, tool is used in a crime, there should be no penalty for owning it, carrying it, using it. Um, there are already plenty of laws that make it illegal to use anything, your hands, a club, a knife, gun, mm -hmm. doesn't matter what, to commit a violent crime or to commit a crime at all. Beyond that, there's no reason to penalize people for carrying whatever they want to carry. And that's why our goal is to simply get rid of all knife bans. And we've accomplished that in a lot of states. And we're going to continue working at that with the support of, you know, your listeners and others uh, who donate in the ultimate steel. Did I mention the ultimate steel? Oh, let's talk about the ultimate <laughs> steel. So the ultimate steel is our annual fundraiser. Uh, we have uh, currently over $100,000 worth of custom knives, production knives, firearms, uh, an African safari. Uh, we launched our tail end bonus uh, last Sunday. Uh, so everyone who donates from this point on is entered into two separate drawings, both the tail end, which has that great Bren his and her set mm. uh, that's coming and a number of other really cool prizes that are coming uh we'll probably end up with somewhere north of twenty thousand dollars just in that drawing alone and then everyone who enters now is entered in that and the main drawing uh we've got some incredible custom knives from some of the best makers in the country uh values up to seven thousand uh, dollars and one of the unique things about what we do in the ultimate steel is its winner's choice so First person drawn in either drawing gets their choice of all the prizes. It's not just, oh, you won first. You you got drawn first. You get this prize. You get to pick your prize, which we think is really special. So, you know, if you are if you like an automatic, there's automatics. If you like uh, folders, there's all kinds of folders. If you like fixed blades, there's all kinds of fixed blades. Bowie knives, we got those. Hunting knives, we got those. Uh, really Walter cool Brown. firearm, we got a bunch of those too. So uh, the winner's choice part makes it very special so that you can get something you want just beyond just a really cool prize. Uh, when you and I had met in person, shook hands and had a conversation at Blade Show, we were talking over a glass uh, case filled with some of those items. And oh, my gosh, I mean, just drool worthy. I was trying to keep my eyes on you to be polite during the conversation, but they kept wandering down to the, the amazing knives in that we're, uh, glass we're case. Blessed. We're blessed to have a lot of support from the custom knife community. Um, they donate uh, an incredible array of knives to us every year. Uh, engravers engrave them and donate that. Uh, material suppliers donate materials. 
to the makers. Um, it's it's an extraordinary effort, um, and it's only through the ultimate steel uh, that we raise enough money all together with that and industry support that we can continue to do this. It's ridiculously expensive to go to the state houses, to go to hearings, to lobby in in the state house. Um, it's often done at the last minute. It's not unusual for us to have 36 hours to show up at a hearing. Uh, let me tell you, those airplane tickets are expensive. And that hotel room is expensive. Um, but that's how you get things done. You don't get things done just writing letters or sending emails. You show yeah. up, you lobby. Uh, that's how you get the accomplishments that we've accomplished. I mean, 34 bills repealing knife bans in 24 states and over 150 cities since 2010. What's your absolute favorite part of that process? Winning. Winning. I love it. <laughs> uh, Ryan says, I believe knife rights help make autos legal in Illinois. If you have, That's correct. If you That's have an correct. FOID card. So huge. Thank you for that. Is that like a, a FOID? What is that? A, um, uh, like firearms ID card. It, it basically, as long as you're so a prohibited cool. person, you pay like 15 bucks, even, even minors can get void cards if, if they're, uh, guardians or parents sign off on it. Um, it was a, you know, we don't always get everything we want. Part of it's just moving the needle. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, we were able to go from, well, we only want people that will have a concealed carry permit to be able to own a switchblade. And we said, no, 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 that's not good enough. And we ended up compromising. You had to have a FOID card. Well, anyone who's not a pr prohibited person, including minors, can get a FOID card. Mm -hmm. So it's not perfect, but pretty much if you want an auto knife in Illinois and you're not a prohibited person, you can have one. And that was a huge victory. That was not a state where anyone would have bet that we would have been successful getting the switchblade ban removed. And we still need to get preemption done, and that's a whole nother fight. But we will continue working at it until we get it done. Hollywood Tactical says, I have a full-size Hogrider RSK-1 and uh, in both black and satin RSK Mark V. Very nice. Uh, someone, uh, a couple comments back was saying um, that they want to carry concealed fixed blades in California. Um, can, is concealed fixed blade almost anywhere is kind of a, a no-no. Am I right? No, not at all. It, it's illegal in California. And, it, you know, okay. I, I don't know when we'll get California fixed. It's a very, very difficult state to get stuff done in. But they said the same thing about Illinois. So, you know, opportunities arise. Um, but in many of the states, and I don't have the, you know, that's why we have the Legal Blade app. In many states, it's perfectly legal to carry a fixed blade concealed. I mean, think about it. Um, most people carry a neck knife concealed. Right. Yeah, that's are true. Mostly fixed blades. Uh, New York City requires you. Yeah. Oh, that's you to that's carry right. concealed. That's right. You know, which, you can't which, even um, have it clipped to your pocket. Um, it's it's you know one of the peculiarities of New York City. You but can't even have it airport. printing through your clothes. Yeah, you can't you even shouldn't. have it printing. Um, uh, Sean Lowry uh, Loki was uh, suggesting uh, you for president. I'm all for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, uh, Ryan um, just had something up uh, in Chicago. Open carry. Uh, is any length and concealed is less than two and a half. Does a pocket clip exposed make it open carry? Well, there is very little, um, very few legal decisions on that issue in the in the country. But generally speaking, uh, when you look at concealed carry of firearms, it basically boils down to if law enforcement can tell that you're carrying something, then it's not concealed, which obviously makes a lot of sense. If the cops can see right. it, if the cops right. can tell you're carrying it, then it's not concealed. Uh, typically, that doesn't mean printing, but obviously, if you have a pocket clip showing in the top of the knife, it's pretty obvious it's a knife. Right. Uh, Yvonne says, uh, thank you for everything you design and do for the community, Doug. Love my Mark Ones, plural, and mad respect for all of your efforts. <laughs> uh, 
cool. Uh, oh, Hag says, great episode. Really enjoying this. Well, thank you, Hag. Super. Great, great to you have know, you all, here. All of you who are buying my knives, you, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I could not do knife rights. I, I could not afford to do knife rights, which pays I and my wife nothing. Um, if we didn't have the income from those knives, that's what keeps the roof over our head. That's what allows us, allows me and Sue, me to spend almost all my time on knife rights. Sue to spend a significant amount of her time on knife rights. Um, we couldn't do it otherwise. And it just, it just pleases me so much that people find my knives worthwhile and, you know, Hogue is killing it, uh, oh, quality absolutely. And, and performance. Uh, it's really been a great partnership. So, yeah, Hogue is just amazing. I was talking to someone. I'll get to Patina's question in a second, but I was talking to someone. Uh, who was I talking? Well, I was talking to someone the other night at the pool. We were talking about guns. Oh, I know a neighbor of mine who has a lot of guns, and and he just lost uh, a benchmaid uh, that his kids got him, and he's a carpenter and he uses his knives all the time. And he's like, I think I'll get an Emerson. No, I think I'll get. And he was going through. And I'm like. You should check out a Hogue RSK1 if you like the if you like the sort of um, action of that lock. Uh, I got a, I got a really great knife to to recommend. And he's thank like, you. And <laughs> you're welcome. And he's like Hogue makes knives, and I was like they make tremendous oh, yeah. knives. Every, well, every, you know, everything we've been making them for eleven years now, and yeah. people are still they they are perhaps the most underrated knife company in the country. Um, they're known for the grips and they've obviously been doing that and, and other firearms related stuff for, for decades and decades, but they make really great knives. They really do. And it doesn't seem like they've been doing it for 11 years. I remember when they first came out with, uh, with the Elishowitz designs and it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but yeah, I guess when I, when I think of how old my daughter is, it kind of makes sense. You know, <laughs> when you start comparing it to other things in your that, life, that'll make you feel old real quick. <laughs> yeah. So will the, uh, the birthday bash we have coming up, uh, um, no, I feel I feel just fine. So Patina had a question about Arizona selling, uh, not selling certain knives to certain states. Do you know anything about that? You mean Amazon? Amazon? Did you say Amazon or Arizona? Amazon. Boy, Amazon. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So so Amazon is a problem. I mean, that's the only way I can politely put it. Uh, they're huge. They're big. They don't care. Uh, I've had numerous conversations with people at Amazon. Um, they just don't care. You know, they come up with these rules based on somebody sitting in a cubicle someplace and, you know, they won't sell that knife in that particular place. Amazon, it, there are a lot of problems with Amazon and for knife owners or knife purchasers um it's an issue uh, all i can say is there's nothing on amazon that you can't buy from some other knife retailer oftentimes for exactly the same price or within a buck or two uh, and you're supporting someone who believes in the knife community as part of the knife community uh, there's not much we can do about amazon or or just Knife owners are not a big enough part of their business for them to care right. a bit about us. Right, right. So that's weird. So it, it does it have to do with the state laws? They won't send certain uh, knives. It's, it's to their interpretation of state and city laws, uh, oftentimes, which have no basis in reality. Right. Um, and, you know, you'll see knives that they'll sell in the state and knives they won't sell in a state and the same mechanism, that are same size. They're, it's, there's, there's no real rhyme or reason to, to their rule. It's, it's just the raw exercise of power. There you go. Uh, so Shane wants to know what's the absolute best state for knife laws? Arizona. Arizona. I mean, Arizona's never had any illegal knives. It was the first state that we've passed knife law preemption in. Uh, so, and I live here, so I'm, I'm sort of prejudiced. Yeah. I'm yeah. biased in that regard. Um, but there are a number of states where we've gotten rid of all their knife laws and passed preemption. Uh, Alaska, Kansas, um, Georgia, virtually. Um, we're getting there in Texas. Um, it, it's, a, it's a process. But the goal is be like Arizona. 
You no, like Arizona. No knife bans. Preemption gets rid of all the local bans. I mean, this is this is what we're after. So this is uh, this is uh, well. First of all, uh, the comment before this said. Uh, that was JN saying hello and thank you, but also he felt like you were just describing Kansas's knife laws. Um, I'm not yeah. exactly sure uh, which which uh, state he was referring to, but uh, well, I mean Arizona uh, was the first state we accomplished preemption. Kansas, I don't remember what year, but you know we got rid of their bans. We passed knife law preemption, so it's like Arizona as far as knife laws. You know there are yeah. no illegal knives, and there's knife law preemption. So Hollywood Tactical was saying, obviously, he lives in California. He's had a number of uh, situations with police officers in California, but they've always given him his knife back, which is cool. And it also just points to the fact that um, oftentimes, you know, uh, the people who make the laws and the people who enforce the laws are just very different types of people. And if you're cool with the people who enforce the laws, man, your, your chances are better anyway of prevailing. Yeah, you know, they're better in any case. Well, partly it depends on where you're stopped and who stops you. Right. You know, typically sheriffs are much more understanding of people carrying knives and weapons anywhere in this country than are uh, big city police departments. Right. Um, but it, you know, there law enforcement has a range of options when they stop you, and you know, partly it depends on your attitude partly depends on why they stopped you but the fact of the matter is uh it can go well or it can go bad and um the solution from our perspective is get rid of the law so they can arrest you for carrying that knife in the first place right uh you know nick shabazz right uh yeah. nick, nick shabazz always uh when he measures a blade in his uh in his knife reviews, he always says, ah, it's, it's under three inches dependent. You know, if you measure it from the very tip of the, uh, tip of the, uh, handle, or if it's down here, it depends on how the, how cool the cop is, or if the cop likes you basically, uh, in a lot of the, the measuring things. Well, traditionally the industry and all but a few jurisdictions measure from the end of the handle, um, to the tip of the blade in a straight line. Right. Um, there have been a few decisions, and I don't remember exactly which states they're at, but we got an app for that um, uh, that measure differently. But generally speaking, it's not the length of the knife edge. It's the length from the end of the handle or where the handle would end if it's a integral or it doesn't have any scales. Uh, and, and the tip in a straight line um, never hurts to be – look – we make a 2.94 inch knife just under three inches mm -hmm. and i make a 3.4 inch knife just under three and a half inches and there's a reason we're just under because there are some places still where those length limits apply right. and so we make sure and we measure from the end of the handle to the tip hey uh uh jim can you go back to ryan's comment it was a couple back uh about a collaboration but i I, I didn't have time to read the whole thing. Um, it looked like a, an interesting thing, but we've had uh, we've had someone uh, say thanks for your work. I think he was in Wisconsin, Spirited Whiskey. Uh, we also know him as Spirited Blade. Says uh, just an idea, but I just uh, like many makers do collabs together. Why don't you start doing knife rights collaboration pieces with different custom makers and lotto or auction them off? Interesting idea. So we've had suggestions similar to that, and there are a few makers um, who will occasionally auction off a knife and donate the proceeds to knife rights. Um, but we have found the ultimate steal uh, where makers donate a knife uh, to us, and we have it as part of our fundraiser to be the most efficient and effective way to do that. Um, it, it's... Uh, it's been working well for close to a decade now. And I, you know, if, if there's a maker out there who wants to help us um, and is listening, you know, please contact me. Uh, click the link on our website and send me an email because that is the most effective way for most makers to support us is by donating knife so that 
more people want to win these knives and donate money to get that opportunity. Uh, we've, we've tried other things. We've tried auctions. We've tried stuff like that. We just, you know, this is what seems to work best for us. Doug, let me ask you a personal question here. Um, well, it's not that personal. What kind of knives do you like? I'm, I'm assuming you, you must have, uh, you know, more than just an RSK one lying around. You must have some knives in all your years in the business. What's your collection like? What kind of things do you, uh, do you prefer? So, I just cleaned out a couple of knife drawers um, and and gave away a lot of knives to to friends of mine um, because you know I mean you've been there it, they pile up sometimes yeah they um, do but I I I have a few very fancy knives well relatively fancy knives that um, that I have acquired over the past couple decades um, but most of my knives that I have are knives that I like because they're functional and practical. And um, that is that is my thing. Um, I don't have a huge collection of fixed blades. Um, I, I have a small collection from, uh, from friends, uh, close friends. And, you know, in one case, Ethan Becker, a board member um, who, you know, whose products I like. Um, you know, I, there are a lot of people, including yourself, who have much more interesting collections than I do. You know, I think, I think we discussed at one point, you know, my first good knife, uh, was a Chris Reeves Sabenza that I saved my lunch money up to buy. Um, and I, you know, I still have excellent relationships with the, with the Reeves. Um, Ann Reeve was the very first person when we started up knife rights to make a donation, uh, from industry to uh to allow us to get our feet on the underneath us um great company great people tim is doing an incredible job there oh, yeah. but, you know we have we have great relationships with a lot of the of the makers out there and um you know i just, did, i'm not so much a collector i'm a user oh, yeah did you say uh that the the sabenza was the knife that inspired you to make the original uh, Ritter Griptilian or the RSK one because you wanted a a blade similar to that or a, a blade that was effective like that with a great steel like that but in a handle that was way less complicated or way less expensive. So so the original RSK Mark One came about from my equipped to survive days and my recommendations and there was always a but at the end of the recommendation. Um, <laughs> There really wasn't a knife that had all the features that I wanted, and um, and and eventually, that ended up with the RSK Mark One. Um, at the time that we did that back in two thousand five, um, uh, I remember Les Deasis from Benchmade time and again saying nobody is going to buy a high end steel and an inexpensive handle. There, it's, nobody's going to do that. And in the end, uh, a friend of mine who had a online presence for a retail operation uh, said, look, if he'll build them, I'll buy them and we'll sell them. And, and it, eventually that's what happened. He said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll make this knife for you. We'll take the Griptilian handle, we'll put your blade style, which was, was in fact heavily influenced by uh, the Chris Reese Benza blade style shape. Uh, but with a flat grind and at S30V at the time, which was the steel. Right. Um, and it sold to everyone's surprise but me, apparently, and, and my partner. Um, and, and now, you know, high-end steels, high-tech steels on affordable handles uh, are commonplace. Yep. So, you know, we started a trend. So Ryan just had a great idea, another great idea, saying uh, with that Chris Reeve knives story, Tim Reeve should do a sprint run of Knife Rights Sabenzas with your logo and CPM Magna Cut blades. They would fly off the shelves. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think Tim has any problem getting rid of the knives. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, at this point in time, 
you know, production makers are busy. Yeah. You know, they don't have any trouble selling knives. And and I, I, Reeves family has never had any trouble selling their knives. Uh, you know, we did a, a short run back in the day, uh, modeled after my first Sebenza, which was one of the very first knives that uh, Chris did uh, with a custom engraving on it. Um, I think I have it here. Hold on. Yeah. Here we go. So there we go. Can you see that? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so that was. Oh, turn it, turn it upside down. Turn it the other way so we can read the. There we Equipped go. to survive. How cool. With, with our compass. Your logo. compass. And this was in, in the end, I, you know, we did a short run of these. Uh, I think we ended up with 11 or 12 that were produced. Uh, that the people purchase, but let's see that um, blade. Oh wow, that is so cool! And when I when I came out with my Mark One, th this was my carry blade for years and years. Um, when I came out with my Mark One, um, it was time to retire it. I I got them to uh, to pretty it up a little, but I asked them not to touch the engraved part because that really, there were a lot of history and memories involved with that. Um, but um, yeah, this, this was my first real knife that, that, that wasn't, um, that wasn't bought at a hardware store or something like that. Right. All right, so um, I don't want to keep you all night. I'm sure you have dinner to eat and all that, but uh, well, I so made this time. I made sure to eat dinner first. You ate dinner first. Awesome. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Everyone, please remember to hit. Oh yeah. Everyone, please remember to hit the like button. Show Bob, Jim, and Doug your appreciation for the great live stream and everything Doug has done for knife rights. Absolutely. And uh, and please stop you, by man. the the Ultimate Steel uh, knife rights dot org or dot org or. Uh, ultimatesteel.org. Um, $20 gets you in the drawing. $100 gets you a really nice sog knife as well as nine chances to win. Um, that's what we need to keep doing what we're doing. I appreciate all your guys' support, but it does take money to continue this fight, continue to forge a sharper future for all Americans. All right. Before I let you go, there's something we do here. Uh, at the end of every uh, 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 Thursday Night Knives, and, and we'll just bring this up right now because I want the honor of debating you. We do a knife fight at the end of every every show, a knife fight, and it's always something you know really important, like flipper versus thumb stud, or or um, you know uh, clip point versus tanto, or something like this. And and tonight's knife fight is carrying one versus carrying multiple, and it seems like you're a a great guy to do this debate and we both get a minute and a half or so and uh would would you be willing to do this sure all right which side do you want you want to you want to carry uh, i think i'm going to take the multiple side okay all right all right so um seeing as you're the guest on the show i'll let you go first or uh, unless you want me to go first and set the stage i i like that idea better because okay all right you just drop this on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I do it, man. Some some nights, uh, frequently, actually, I debate myself. So, uh, you know, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, you might see a doctor about that one. Yeah, I know. I know. I've been told. <laughs> All right. Uh, in three, two, one. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having me at this esteemed venue for this very <laughs> important debate. <laughs> I am here to debate on the side of carrying one knife. It could be argued that we don't use our knives enough. It could be argued that we've, with this hobby, turned into a materialists, kind of unnecessarily uh, acquisitive and acquiring knife after knife after knife in search of some, some golden mean that we cannot grasp. Um, I say, that it is important to carry a knife, but I also say that it's important to use your knives. And carrying one knife will ensure that that knife gets carried, that knife gets used. And that is the important part. So um, when, I, when I walk out the door, I have one knife in my pocket. I want to 
experience that knife the entire day and uh, and really get a, a, a chance to test the cut of its jib and see how it does. Carrying multiple knives is a, it's kind of a distraction. It will lead to fidgeting. It will lead to uh, lack of focus. And um, therefore, one knife is the way to go and uh, and it, to truly bond with and get to know the, the properties and qualities of said knife and scene. Have, have you considered getting into politics? <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> I can oh, well, BS I, for at least two hours. So there you go. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of good reasons to carry two knives. I mean, I carry at least two knives for a very personal reason because I get stopped and people want to see both sizes of my knife. But that's a most people aren't going to deal with that sort of issue. Look, I'm I'm a survival guy. I'm you know the survival guy. Uh, Two is one, one is none. Um, and, and there's also the question of uh, appropriateness to the task. You know, a lot of times just small knife works quick and easy. A lot of circumstances, you don't want to whip out a big blade. Uh, I think there are a lot of good reasons to carry multiple knives. Uh, two is good. Three is better. Four is, I mean, carry as many as you want. Um, if they're all RSKs, I'll be even happier. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I I have uh, traditionally um, carried uh, about a three and a half inch folder and a Leatherman charge. Um, that was my carry for years and years and years. So that's three knife blades on me, uh, one serrated, two plain. So. One, one of the, the, the plain edge and the serrated edge and then 11 of them got used for things like gooey tape and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I saved the Sabenza for things that needed, that really needed slicing and dicing and, you know, going out to dinner and whipping out your own knife and say using lousy steak knives and, and, you know, handing your other knife to your guest who is trying to saw his steak open um, with the, a, with the steak knife that they've been given. So yeah, lots of good reasons to carry more than one knife. Excellent, excellent. All right, I know what the answers are gonna be, but let us know who you thought won. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I gotta say, you really- oh, I like that. Yeah, knife math. <laughs> yeah. This is a t-shirt that Jim designed and I love it. Great. And not, I mean, it's not just a t-shirt, it's you can get this on any, any sort of product, but but knife math, I love that. That's pretty much the only math I, I understand. And <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, Doug, um, if you hadn't have guessed, I I of course carry multiple knives. And I counted uh, three. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was just what I had on my very person, not counting what I brought to work and put on the desk and hit under my calendar to, to fiddle with when I'm writing and stuff like that. So, uh, <laughs> hey, uh, Bob, Doug, thank you for all you do. You are appreciated. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. I have a question to ask you offline, Jared. Um, but uh, you really got me with the steak knife argument because I got to say, um, I cannot stand going and, you know, it's uh, since I've gotten my cholesterol reading back, it's less that I eat steak. And when I do, it's more of an occasion. And I will be damned if I'm going to sit down with that wet handled, you know, uh, wooden handled steak knife that that is loose in the handle and has uh dull serrations bob you already lost <laughs> it is true and uh so yes i always have a, a i always have my own steak knife on me and uh always try and get my wife to to use my other knife well um, my wife you might be terribly surprised who carries a a mini rsk mark one um purple with the purple yeah I had to I had to uh, kind of go into my wife's bag, which I never do without asking, except when she had this because it mysteriously just sort of integrated into her purse. And I was just like, mm -mm, I've sounds, gotten you. Sounds, have. sounds like you need to get your wife a, a nice Christmas present. This I day. think I think I will. I think I will. Cause she loves this knife. But you know what? It's mine. <laughs> just kidding. Good luck with that. 
Yeah, no. Never work for me. Just kidding. Just kidding. It's all ours, baby. The whole thing is ours. Um, except for this. Uh, Blade Hobby, too fun to hear Bob lie. LOL. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. You know, uh, but that's the art of debate, right? You you should, you know, you should be able to debate either side, even a ridiculous side that says carry one knife. You noticed how weak my argument was because, you know, I don't really feel that way. Bob has gotten so good at debating because he's used to debating two sides for a live stream. It's true. It's true. I, well, I do it was it. fun. And it I is. like winning, so we're good. <laughs> A man without a knife is a man without a life. True, I'm, truer words. Sometimes literally. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes quite literally. Do you have any harrowing stories of uh, of knives saving lives? Personally? Yeah. No. Maybe not your life, but I mean. But, do you yeah. I mean, we used to, we, we occasionally still give an award out. Um, uh, carry a knife, save a life. Um the um the last time we did was the gentleman outside of atlanta who was working at uh at the uh, chick-fil-a and saw a, a young person choking on the seatbelt and literally went through the drive-in window with his pocket knife and uh saved this young person's life wow. um it was pretty cool we went uh we went back there. Uh, a lot of uh, the production makers that support us donated knives. He got uh, quite a collection <laughs> of uh, of engraved knives. Um, look, uh, the the idea is if you carry a knife, you're in a position to make a difference, and you will never know when that's going to happen. Um, but I can't imagine a worse feeling in the world than standing there helplessly yeah. and watching someone get hurt or die because, you know, you didn't have a knife. Yeah. Um, and, and we read stories on the news, you know, on a regular basis of whether it's a, a law enforcement officer or someone who just happens to go by a, a, a something that's going on an accident or otherwise and are able to cut someone loose. Um, you know, it. I just can't imagine not having a knife. The only time you will not find me with a knife is if I'm in a courthouse, if I'm flying, right, right. Um, if uh, we're at a state legislature where they don't allow knives, uh, which a surprising number of them are just fine with it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, get up in the morning put my pants on and knife goes in the pocket. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's just, you know. Yeah. It, it comes out of my pajamas pocket when I get in bed, basically. That's, that's how it works. Wait, oh wait, man. You take it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait. There've been a few times where I've been like, Ooh, I hope this doesn't come out. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Thank you for a fantastic live stream. And thank you, Mr. Doug Ritter. That, that is awesome. Thank for you, sure. sir. Yeah. I appreciate it too. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, what can I say? Um, thank you very much. Uh, Monster says, I mean, how could you possibly go against Doug Ritter? <laughs> it's not some normal guy named Doug. It's Doug Ritter. I know, but I mean, like, what a, what a chance to actually have a real debate. I not that, not that the debates with other guests haven't been real. They've all been awesome. But, you know, I get tired of debating myself, and here I have the man to do it with. So only one knife. Would you tell your mechanic one wrench? Exactly. You know, um, Ernest Emerson has a, a great story of how he was in a mall once and he was riding up the escalator with his wife and a little kid got his shoelace stuck in the escalator. And by the time he got to the top, it was like, it was like wrenching his leg and pulling him into it. And he just kind of came up and, and cut it. And, you know, people were freaking out. He kind of just cuts the, cuts the shoelace and frees the kid and walks off. And, and he, he, he relates that he heard someone say, who was that man with the knife? <laughs> I just think that's hilarious. But well, but it's another you example. You want to be that man. You yes. want to be that woman. Exactly. Um, you don't want to be the person asking who has a knife. Right. I mean, those of us who carry knives, how many times have we been in a situation where work, play, parties, you name it, 
Well, I'm sure uh, that that's the have a knife. That's the reason why many of us care. Sean wants to know about a titanium RSK, which is an interesting question. But that's why many of us carry multiple knives in the first place. It's like, well, I don't think I want to. I don't think I want to give him this to cut with. So here, take take my, um, you know, take whatever I else. I good have. reason to carry more than one knife. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I'm fine with handing someone my RSK because hopefully they'll like it and buy one. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so any any plans for a, a titanium RSK? Sean Loki was asking. So as at, 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 as I often type on my Instagram account, as a matter of policy, we don't discuss future products. Oh, I but like there are future products. I mean, awesome. But um, yeah, we we like hearing from folks. We like hearing what they want. Um, one of the reasons that you have a purple mini, uh, that there's a red mini is because people asked about that and it was something that we could do um you know more something like titanium i mean it's not out of the question yeah let us know yeah yeah it sounds like uh we've it, already gotten a, a lot more <laughs> yeah that's for sure you know because uh, because you can't do one of these knives i i feel at this point you have to have that radiant milling i mean the the, the milling that radiates become, it's become a trademark and it is so good. Uh, so good. very time consuming. And I if bet. you think it's time consuming on G10, try doing it on metal. Yeah. Right, exactly. You know. Thank you, Hag. I appreciate it greatly. Uh, and I know it's because Doug is here, but still, I appreciate <laughs> it greatly. <laughs> All right, well, Doug, it's been a pleasure having you here, man. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in one of these weird spots where I could talk to you all night but uh, at the same time, you've been you've been with us for an hour and fifteen minutes, and you also did the the supplemental this week, and uh, and well, I appreciate well, this, it. This has been fun. I enjoy doing it. We'll have to do it again sometime. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone. I hope you'll check out the Ultimate Steel, um, and I wouldn't be upset at all if you bought one of my knives. <laughs> God. <laughs> Yes, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, so thank you, sir. It's been great having you. And uh, well, you I think I think uh, I, I think well, you you said you'd be there at the birthday bash, so we'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, <laughs> you did say it. I wrote it down. <laughs> well, in any case, thank you, sir. It's been great having you. You bet. All right. Have take a great care. evening. Thanks. You too. All right, everybody. I think uh, I think with that knife fight, we're gonna we're gonna pull this one to a close. I I, uh, I did have an oldie, but well, let me show you the oldie book goodie, and then we're gonna. I think we're gonna dip out of here. Uh, JN says, "Great talk, y'all." This this is the knife we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dance out to. Uh, this is an old uh, knife in my collection. This is the Sog Super Bowie, and this is what I like best from Sog. This kind of knife. Um, just a quick story about this one um as you all put in your comments about what a what a how he just uh, shellacked me in that debate <laughs> thank you patina appreciate it and a shellacking it was indeed i mean you can tell that i didn't have my heart in it uh uh you know i didn't want to beat beat the master so i decided i'd go easy on him no i'm just kidding i of course also have did not believe in what I was saying. So it was hard to conjure up uh, something to say. Uh, interesting story about this one. I agree. This is the ultimate SOG. I love this knife. I've always loved the shape of the SOG Bowie or Bowie, depending on who I'm talking with. And uh, I was living in New York City when I ordered this on Knife Center and was having it delivered to my uh, the office I was working in. And I remember uh, obsessively following the tracking, and it took a while uh, to get there. And um, it—that's a knife. There's a there a bit, yeah. And uh, so I was following the tracking. It it was supposed to be in the building. It didn't show up. I, uh, for lack of a better term, forced my way into the mailroom and made the guy go through every bit of mail in a pretty large office building in New York City until he found the box and I walked out of it. I mean, I was on a mission. I was sweating and, uh, and uh, well, I ended up walking out with this. Of course, I've never used it. This was my 
uh, travel knife for a long time. My wife and I lived in different cities before we got married uh, for a, a while, and I would always put this in my bag and uh, head out the door with it. I thought it would be, you know, good, a good survival knife and all, and all that. But really, what it is is just a super cool fighting knife. I gotta say, uh, it's got it's got a nice hollow grind. And then look at the tip. Something I've always appreciated about the tip of these knives. Just sh uh, sharpened ever so slightly on the back for a little ksh, little back cut, you know? Ksh, gouge out the guy's arm as he as he tries to thrust his, his uh, second-rate knife into your belly. I won't be having that today, sir. Wham! Hit him with the, that little sharpened tip. I just think it's really cool. A little classy touch. Damn, that SOG is amazing. It's true. This is what they have always done best. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Ezekiel and Jonathan. I think it is cool. And then they made a whole bunch of others in this class and I just let them pass me by and now they don't make them anymore or with the stacked leather handles and everything. Like the uh, the government agent I think was one and um, they, they made a dagger like this and a lot of cool stuff. But yep, that is a true clip point right there. Love this thing. That Bowie can make a robber become Usain Bolt. Exactly. Exactly. But you got to turn on the light because that that beautiful coating uh, just blends into the into the background. That has the most beautiful saga I've ever seen. Well, I, I, I could say thank you, but I didn't design it or make it. I just uh, blew the money I didn't have to buy it at the time. So, yeah, I've had this uh, about 15 years at this point. And... Uh, you know, this is about the most action it's seen. It uh, stays in my cabinet with my, um, with my, uh, uh, with my, what, what the hell do you call it? Spartan Harzi dagger and my um, uh, Randall made knives. It, it's kind of a, just kind of combat classic style, amazing leather sheath with a stone that's never been used. So there you have it. I think we're going to roll out on this beautiful knife. Thank you one and all for showing up. Uh, be sure to show up on Sunday for episode 238. That's the Knife Junkie podcast with Josiah DeMille of Millet Knives. What an interesting guy. What an interesting story and cool stuff they're doing at Millet. And we know them for their amazing product, but uh, you can really, uh, you can hear some great trials and tribulation stories from from Josiah in in, you know, getting them to be what they are today. Um, and, uh, you can also check us out audio wise. If you just, uh, you know, you're mowing the grass, you're doing the dishes. I always say that cause those are some of my ac actually favorite chores. I love doing both of those things. Uh, you can find us on Apple podcasts, Google, iHeart, Spotify, Stitcher, tune in, and a whole host of others. Uh, if you just want to hear the golden tones of the knife junkie, uh, just purchased an RSK on Monday. It'll be here Saturday. It's my first Hogue. Can't wait. Well, I, I couldn't say that you picked a better Hogue because, man, well, they're all they're all great, but I love the the Ritter ones. I gotta say. Good night, guys. Good night, Incognito. Good night, Chris. Good night, Monster. Good night, Michael. Always a pleasure. And Hag, my pleasure, man. Uh, sh uh, see you next. Uh, see you Sunday. See you next Wednesday. Uh, so for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I am Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, saying don't take dull for an answer.